Um, so I'm going to give you kind of my scoop on companion planting. Actually, this is not my scoop. Um, this is Whitney, Dr. Whitney Crenshaw's scoop. Um, he is a retired professor of entomology with Colorado State University. Um, he's an author of a book, which I don't think is in print anymore, but I happen to really love called Pests of the West. Um, and so here is, here's what he kind of breaks down in terms of companion planting. The basic idea that you oftentimes hear is that interplanting with certain companion plants will repel or, uh, or prevent attacks on uh, nearby plants by some sort of an insect pest. So some of the ones you commonly hear are things like nasturtiums, repel flea beetles, marigolds are effective against almost all garden pests. Um, herbs have pest adverting properties. And it is true that almost all plants produce some defensive chemicals, allele, allele, allele chemicals for uh, prevention against attacks, but there's essentially no evidence that interplanted compa companion plants deter insect, um, excuse me, sorry, uh, deter insect attacks on nearby plants by um, chemical repellency. So unlike humans, insects are really only able to detect only a very few odors. And sometimes they're actually drawn to things that um, are considered harmful to humans. For example, the Western cabbage flea beetle is highly attracted to mustard gas um, given off by things like radish and cabbage. And marigold and garlic odors are likely not detected by most passing um, insects. And so we kind of have to put it in perspective um, and not take a kind of an anthropocentric view on what is going to repel or deter insects based on uh, what we smell as, as humans or detect as humans. Um, so this was a uh, spring newsletter that was put out by our very own Mayor Murray, who is the Integrated Pest Management product, Project Leader. This was uh, back in 2010, and I really liked um, her analysis of companion planting. She combed some of the literature and provided this. That she said, uh, companion plant, vegetable planting for home and local markets. It's, it's a historical concept. It's passed between generations from neighbor to neighbor. The idea that the presence of one species improves the growth of another. Many recommendations are based on uh, folklore and tradition rather than scientific research. There are, however, some valid mechanisms of certain plant associations that can lead to minor pest suppression and greater crop yields. Um, and so we're gonna go through some of these documented benefits from plant associations and I won't read the rest of it. You can read it yourself. Um, this is kind of following her newsletter um, in the next few slides um, of what are some of these evidence-based um, uh, benefits from plant associations. Okay, so the first one that we want to look at is uh, nitrogen fixation. And uh, nitrogen fixation uh, occurs in the pea and bean family, so things like peas and clover. Um, it is a beneficial symbiotic relationship between the plant and a bacteria, typically rhizobium. And the rhizobium will uh, infest the roots. Uh, what the rhizobium is able to do miraculously is to fix atmospheric or, or gaseous nitrogen down at the root system of the plant. And so uh, since nitrogen is the macronutrient in which plants need in the greatest abundance that they take up from the soil, um, this is a huge benefit to those plants. And we see these in things like uh, hairy vetch, which is a winter cover crop, um, alfalfa, soybeans, beans, less so in beans, but we do still see it in beans. And um, there's a nice um, uh, study that was done uh, by Manorama and Lal in 2010 that showed that um, potatoes planted with beans uh, produced larger tubers as opposed to ones that were not planted with beans. So we can see that effect there. Um, it is also an important tool for uh, crop rotation. We know that we should be rotating uh, crops by families. So for example, we have a lot of different uh, types of garden plants that are in the same family that makes them susceptible to very similar insect and disease injury. And so we should be rotating those family members out of same garden area year to year. Um, and so um, this is a, a great way um, sometimes to uh, do, do a rotation in that process. Um, and also a great way uh, to uh, succeed heavy nitrogen feeders. Crops like corn, tomato, and cabbage uh, require a lot of nitrogen and so um, 
if you are rotating between uh, nitrogen uh, fixing plants and some of these more heavy nitrogen feeders, it's a great way to supply some of those nitrogen needs to those plants. Um, the pictures I should show you, this is a picture at the Salt Lake County Jail Horticulture um, uh, Program Garden that is hairy vetch. You actually seed it uh, late fall and it uh, sustains through the winter. And then you can see the rhizobium, rhizobium nodules probably on a pea root system in the other picture. Okay, another example um, is nurse cropping. Um, in this type of an association, you can plant tall, dense plants to protect more tender plants. It could provide some, um, some sun protection, so provide a little bit of shade uh, or wind and dust as well. I actually kind of threw dust in there. I haven't seen that as much in the scientific literature, but um, I think that there is, some, there is some possibility there. I'll give you an example here in a minute. Um, but uh, one study found that oats planted with alfalfa um, help to suppress weeds during the establishment um, period. And so it provided that weed suppression in that particular case. Um, uh, tall crops like corn can provide shade for more tender crops. Um, I have seen a couple local farmers actually use uh, rows of sunflowers towards the uh, exterior of a field planting, um, in particular along a dirt or gravel road. We know in those types of conditions, we're gonna have a lot of dust that's getting kicked up and that dust can move into the field. And some things like spider mites, for example, uh, really prefer hot, dusty conditions. And so that's a way to try to trap or keep that dust from moving into that, that field situation. So those are just a few examples. Okay, moving into pest suppression. Um, there are a few examples there as well. Um, chemical exudates from certain plants uh, have pesticidal properties. One example is marigolds of this particular species produces a compound lethal to the Mexican bean weevil uh, through the leaves, I believe the stem as well, and cabbage maggot larvae um, through the roots. Um, another example is uh, mowed down rye grain residue. So this is rye grain that was uh, mowed down, okay, so it was kind of crimped down. Um, it's used as a mulch to prevent uh, weed germination. Um, but if you're planting with transplants, with small plants, um, there was no harm to the transplants across a, a range of different vegetables. And so that's another example there. Um, also mixing plant varieties of the same species may circumvent insects ability to adapt to natural plant defenses. Uh, so there's a nice study here where uh, it, different uh, barley cultivars were mixed in a field and it showed uh, reduced aphid feeding compared to um, a field that was planted in only one cultivar of barley. So I guess what I wanna kind of start to uh, express through uh, some of these examples is that there are definitely some of these associations that occur through companion planting, but it's not broad across the board. It's very specific circumstances, it's specific plants having associations with sp specific insect pests. And so you have to be careful there. Um, so think about that as we move a little further in the presentation. Um, so mixing plant species, um, sometimes this can cause an interference with visual or olfactory orientation of pests to their uh, favorite host plants. So uh, insect pests uh, don't typically have a broad range of hosts that they prefer. They have specific hosts that they prefer. Um, so they're trying to find members, they're, they're trying to find that particular plant or that, that particular family of plants. And so uh, one way this was uh, mentioned was security through diversity. And I liked that. So the more confusing you can make your garden, the more difficult you can make it for an insect pest to find its favorite host plant, possibly the better off you're going to be in terms of not seeing uh, large increases in, um, in that in insect pest population. Um, and those of you that uh, have listened to some of my lectures in the past know that I'm a big fan of uh, creating refugia. Uh, another name for this could be insectary plantings um, for beneficial insects. And so these are flowering plants. Um, typically they're flowering plants that are rich in pollen and nectar. And we wanna think about some different considerations. For example, you wanna provide a continuous source of blooms 
So you want to have early spring blooming, late spring, early summer, late summer, early fall, late fall blooming. So always a source of, of, of pollen and nectar available, um, which is going to provide uh, not only a food source, it could be pollen, it, it very much could be nectar. And uh, sometimes beneficial insects actually consume uh, nectar in certain portions of their life cycle. Um, and so uh, to sustain populations, to keep them around um, through different, through the entire life cycle, it's really important to have um, flowering plants and nectar sources there, they're available for them. It could be just the larvae, for example, that's eating insect pests that gives you that pest control. Um, also, uh, refugia is going to create shelter um, for beneficial insects, uh, hunting grounds, um, and I liked, I uh, saw a publication um, on beetle banks. I'll talk to you about beetle banks here in just a minute um, from a uh, Southern farmer that said that sometimes they can provide meat in places too. So we have a lot of beneficial insects around. They have the opportunity to meet each other and that can really help in terms of reproductive uh, success as well. So um, really that refugia is, is very important in terms of attracting and also retaining beneficial insects in and around a garden area or a landscape. So just wanna give you a few examples here. Um, before you worry so much about feverishly writing all of this down, I'm gonna give you a place at the end of the presentation where you can pull up a PDF of these slides. So no worries there, okay? Um, lay swings. Um, lace wings prey upon a lot of different things, but um, actually in the middle, we have a lace wing larvae. These are actually called aphid lions. They are so voracious. They, they get the hangries <laughs> when they hatch. Um, and they are such voracious eaters of aphids. Actually, if their uh, prey is not right there uh, when, uh, when they hatch and become these larvae, then they will actually consume each other. And so they are wonderful, wonderful um, uh, beneficial insects, predators of aphids. Um, in, in, the, in the garden and the, the field settings. Um, the eggs are laid on these silken strands. Some of you might see that sometimes. Um, of course, you can see the larvae in the middle and then the adult. Um, you have green and brown lace wings. They're actually attracted to lights at night. So that's one time when I actually see quite a few of the adults out. Attractive flowers are things in the carrot and sunflower families, um, uh, buckwheat and What's that last one there? Oh, and corn as well. Okay, parasitoid wasps. Um, these are uh, exceptionally good natural enemies in our landscapes. Um, oftentimes they're quite tiny. Um, so you may not know you're looking at them unless you, you look kind of hard and you'll see them. Um, they prey upon things like um, aphids, army worms, cabbage worms, calling moth, beetle larvae flies and caterpillars. Um, they are parasitoids, so they're actually laying their eggs inside or on their host. As these eggs hatch, they will consume that host. So sometimes you can see evidence, evidence of this in the landscape. It's, it's pretty brutal. I like to say, be happy you're as big as you are in your garden, because if you were about two millimeters high, it would be a very scary place for you to be. There would be a lot of things that would want to eat you, <laughs> uh, including these guys, maybe. Um, attractive flowers are things like caraway, dill, fennel, parsley, white clover, mustard, yarrow, sunflower, hairy vetch, buckwheat, and crocus. Um, and we have, of course, this to tomato hornworm there that, oh my gosh, it's lunch. <laughs> Not a good prognosis for that, for that hornworm. Okay, ladybird beetles, many of us know this, or ladybugs, uh, prey upon aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, soft scales, um, attracted to a lot of different types of flowers, caraway, dill, parsley, fennel, white clover, goldenrod, mustard, yarrow, sunflower, buckwheat, hairy vetch, and others. Um, you are going to see a lot of herbs being repeated, and you should, um, in my opinion, plant more herbs than you plan to consume in your garden and um, allow a portion of them go to go to flower because they really do help to attract a lot of these sorts of things. Um, it's also very important to recognize what these things look like at different stages in their life cycle. Um, here you have a uh, ladybird uh, larvae, and then, of course, the adult as well. A lot of people don't recognize the larvae. Um, crawling around um, and they'll actually try to control them sometimes. And so make sure you know what you're looking at and, um, and you wanna leave those guys alone, of course, because they're excellent uh, pest control for us. Uh, mantids are not excellent pest control. They are, I guess, they're super cool. Um, they just are completely indiscriminate eaters. 
they eat anything they get their reptorial <laughs> hands on or the person's like don't have hands but um uh, but they are super duper cool and um extremely photogenic because they hold perfectly still that's one of the things i love the most about mantids but um they are going to like permanent plantings and so they're going to want things like brambles so blackberries raspberries um, hedgerow plantains um, cosmos are some of the types of um, plants that are going to attract them and then uh, predaceous ground beetle. Um, I think this is my last one. I know there are a lot of other types of beneficial insects. I just didn't have time to go into um, all of them, of course. But um, these are really wonderful pest control for us in yards and gardens and fields. Um, they prey upon almost any type of insect. They are crawling. Um, and so they're going to find things that are down in the soil and on the ground. Things like caterpillars, root maggots, snails, and other soil dwelling insects. Um, Sometimes people, and there's actually been a lot of research about this from uh, Oregon State uh, University. There's a, a researcher there, her name is Gwendolyn Ellen, and she has looked at beetle banks um, and, and how to build them. But the idea here is um, that you have a bermed or slightly raised um, area, typically planted in a native warm season grass or grasses. Um, this is a permanent fixture um, in a field or a landscape or a garden. And it's used sometimes by um, commercial producers because as they come along and they till up um, the soil, it really disturbs these guys and these guys start to scatter. So it gives them kind of a place to go back and retreat to. Um, it is bermed and so there's nice drainage which helps them with their reproductive uh, success. And then as our Southern farmer said, it's great meat in places too. Um, for them. And so these are some of the types of uh, landscape elements or some of the type of, um, of planting elements that can help to sustain populations of bees in these types of areas. Okay, and then uh, Nick wanted to also uh, talk specifically about um, trap cropping. So we're going to spend just a little bit more time talking about trap cropping. And um, the idea here is um, it's successful when one plant species of variety is attracted to a pest and is not affected by yield loss or is used as a sacrificial crop. And um, then the trap crop is either treated or removed after infestation and the pre pest pressure on the desired crop is reduced. Um, so an example of a cross species, for example, could be uh, the petunia carpet blue, which attracts thrips away from things like um, tomatoes and peas. Um, and there are a couple different types of trap cropping. Um, the first type is conventional, and this is really where you're planting a low value crop that is more attractive to pests than an, ad an adjacent higher value crop. Um, so kind of the classic example of this is uh, collard greens planted to draw the diamond back moth away from cabbage. Um, and another really classic example is um, alfalfa. Um, to attract ligus bugs away from cotton. Now this of course is not gonna be across the board, it's specific pests. And so here we have our uh, lovely grasshopper feeding on these colored greens. Um, trap cropping is not gonna work for suppression of these grasshoppers. Uh, but in some of these other um, instances, uh, we do um, see, uh, we do see um, some help in terms of, of um, pest suppression to those desired crops. Another one is sequential, and this uses time to separate pests from valuable crops. Um, one study showed that uh, strawberry seedlings planted alone had a really high mortality rate, 43% mortality rate from wireworms. Um, and in that same study, they, uh, they planted strawberry seedlings um, eight days after uh, wheat had been planted, and the mortality rate dipped down to 5%. And interestingly enough, in the middle, they tried strawberry seedlings planted two weeks before, in, before intercropped with wheat, which had a 27% mortality rate. So we definitely saw kind of a difference in terms of um, uh, mortality rate over time, um, depending on when that wheat and strawberry seedlings were planted together. Um, another example is okra, and that's what you see a picture of here. The flower is, uh, is attractive to stink bugs. Um, okra is also a desirable crop in a lot of settings. And so uh, one idea would be to plant a sacrificial block of okra two weeks prior to planting those plants that you desire to crop. Um, so that um, 
so that the stink bugs are attracted to that sacrificial block. Um, and of course you can monitor that block and then um, either uh, spray it or mechanically remove it if those pest populations um, start to increase. Okay, so um, I found kind of a nice little publication um, from uh, the folks, our friends at uh, University of Georgia Extension. Um, so keep in mind, this is uh, coming from a kind of a southern eastern state. So there may be some things that are maybe a little bit different for us here in the Intermountain West. Um, but I thought that this was kind of nice just to, to provide a few uh, tips for effective uh, trap cropping. Again, from our friends at, at University of Georgia Extension. Um, so one of the things they said is that trap cropping is most effective when, um, when the trap crop is in flower or seed. So typically you want to establish um, the trap crop prior to planting your desired crops. Um, insects are highly attracted to plants that are, are in the reproductive stage of growth. Um, and uh, trap crops that mature quickly and produce some type of seed, uh, fruit or flower are particularly attractive to many damaging um, insects. Um, another tip that they gave was to stagger new plantings of the trap crop every two to three weeks for extended control throughout the season. Um, to plant the trap crop eight to 12 feet away from your desired crop and to plant two to three rows of trap crop at a time. Um, to monitor the trap crop frequently to prevent out of control pest populations. Really important that you don't uh, just cause a population boom of <laughs> damaging insect pests. Um, so you do have to monitor those and um, provide proper care to the trap crop. You do really have to take good care of these if they're going to be effective for you um, as a trap crop. So uh, proper fertility, irrigation, weed control, those types of things. And I think something that I would like to also just make a note of saying is that um, trap cropping is not your silver bullet for all problems related to pests um, that you really should employ or use those in a combination with other um, appropriate um, and effective integrated pest management um, techniques. Um, so with that, I promised I would have a link to my slides provided to you. That's what's on top, organicforecast.org. There's no www, it's just organicforecast.org. That's a blog that I maintain. Um, and if you go there and you go under blog, you'll see a link that will give you a PDF of these slides so that if you need to go back and reference any of that material. And maybe more importantly, you should reference the, uh, the, the material in which I pulled information from this presentation from because there's a lot more information, a lot more detail um, about some of these, these topics and concepts um, in those.